Hi, Ryan. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Oh, I am so keen. I'm so excited. I'm just thrilled to be here. How about yourself? <laughs> yeah, I'm excited and nervous. Nervous? Why yeah. are you nervous? Well, like, this is still new and it's still different. Not used to having my face. That is true. We we don't always do video, but for what we're doing today, we have a video element for all of those who are listening on the audio feed. You can go to our YouTube channel and get a video of what we're doing here today. But Rachel, what is happening on Yum Yum Podcast? Are we are we back to reviewing Star Trek Discovery? I hear it's final seasons coming out, so this no, must be no. us upgrading to video form for that, right? No. Everyone wants to see our miserable faces talk about that. No. No? No. No. Uh, no, we're here for another interview with a Space Above and Beyond cast member. Yes, we have watched through Space Above and Beyond. We have reviewed every episode of it. And now we're talking to people who were involved, anyone who's around and wanting to chat about their time on the show. We've talked to James Morrison. We've talked to Joel Del Fuente. And now we're here to talk to the lead actor himself, the man who was Nathan West Morgan. Hello, Morgan. How are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for having me. It is so great to, to have you here. And I, I just want to say straight off the bat, this isn't in our list of questions, but I, I just want to say this. You are a part of a very special episode of television for me, which is you were in an episode of Quantum Leap. And it was the first <laughs> and it was the first ever episode of Quantum Leap. I had Leap the same I hair. And my yes. hair was about this long. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So it was the first ever episode of Quantum Leap I saw. I was probably like nine years old. It was on TV. Oh, wow. And I was just so mesmerized by this series, like the, the concept of it, the, the heart and soul of it. And, and your episode in particular had such a strange Quantum Leapian concept. And it was where, UFOs. It was yeah. aliens. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But most of the episode is uh, uh, poor old Scott Bakula being like, I'm an old man and nobody believes me. <laughs> <laughs> and you having to hold him and make him walk places as he's like, UFOs, UFOs. I remember there's a funny, so I was, uh, I remember the director leaning in. We were we were filming a scene with the family at the dinner table. And I, so it was like, a, I'm like a, a embryonic little hippie kid, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was just being, you know, my intense emotional like attitude, like teenager self, you know, trying to channel that. And the director leaned over, he's like, I'm having trouble li liking you right now as this <laughs> character. And I don't remember what I said, but I remember taking it so personal. I was like, F you, man. I'm like getting into this is the this is the reality. And I, then later I realized, yeah, it's a damn TV show. It's an enter entertaining sci-fi show. You, you don't maybe don't be such an an a-hole, you know. Can you curse on this show? Oh, yeah, we, we're yeah, Australians. Yeah. You, you can say it all. <laughs> yeah. right, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I just had to get that out of the way because Quantum Leap is a series near and dear to both of our hearts, but especially mine. And the first episode I ever saw, you were in it, and I didn't even connect connect those dots when we were going through like going through space above and beyond because you do look so different, like yeah. the haircut and the mentality. And and in that series, like you said, you were pay playing like the young hippy dippy kid, and and in Space Above and Beyond, you're playing like the young arrogant. <laughs> You know, self serious guy who has to get taken down a peg or two. So yeah. I just wanted to ask that. And I have to ask is Scott Bakula as cool as he appears to be? Like, he seems like such a cool guy or fun guy, but he is he? He's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, uh, so, yeah. Like, like, I think a lot of the stuff I filmed was with the grandfather, his, right? So I don't have, I honestly don't, I don't remember the, how the show played out, how many scenes I had where I was in my memory. I don't have any real memories of working closely with him. So I think it was mostly me and his alter ego. Fair yeah. enough. He seemed, I mean, as, to the extent that I dealt with him, he was cool. Everyone was nice on the show. Um, there was that great old actor, his, the other guy in that show who was in Blue Velvet. I forget Dean his Stockwell. Name. Stockwell. He was cool too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's what I want to hear. Yeah. That's what I want to hear because that that that's that's and that episode is just so particularly of that series where you can have this heartfelt story about generational divide, but also I don't know have aliens in it too if we want. Yeah, we can we, we can have aliens have both, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's crack on with everything, Rachel. Now you're going to start us off. You're going to ask the question that we like to ask any actor or any performer, anyone that's been someone who's involved in the craft. Yeah. It 
And that question is, did you fall in love with acting slowly or instantly? So I, uh, I grew up, my dad's an actor. He's actually someone you've probably seen. He was uh, in Three Amigos. He was in Schindler's List. He's German, so he's he played a lot of, I don't know, a lot, but plenty of Nazis over the years. Uh, he, he's from Frankfurt. Uh, his first film was Midnight Express. He was he was uh, the Swedish character, the gay Swedish character. In oh, Midnight wow. Express. That was his first part. Uh, and uh, what else would you have seen him in? Like, I'd have to, you, you definitely, he was in The Thing. He's the raving, the raving uh, Norwegian <gasps> with the rifle oh chasing God. the dog. That, starts, the that starts the movie. That <laughs> yeah. starts the film. Yeah. He yeah. tried to he tried to warn them, but yeah, they didn't listen. Did. They didn't yeah. speak Norwegian or whatever your dad was doing in that movie. I doubt. I don't know if it was Norwegian. I, I imagine it maybe it, wasn't. It was. just, I think he actually they uh, Carpenter actually allowed him to write some of his dialogue, and he kind of had free reign. And then he worked on it. He had a Norwegian friend, and they worked on it, and he rehearsed his ass off. And uh, yeah, so it's so interesting. I mean, that movie bombed so horribly. I was actually able to go to Rob Bottin's, uh his studio. They took a cast of my dad's face. I was in there with all the tentacles. We actually got scared. We were going to the, we were outside the studio, and there was this this uh, Malamute just standing there, just glowering at us, and we were afraid for like five minutes. And then we realized it was it was one of the stuffed fake dogs from the movie, and we finally <laughs> went inside. And, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's interesting that movie bombed so hard and now it's considered, some people consider it like the greatest sci-fi horror movie ever. You know, I, I was, I was going to ask, what's it like for your, for you to be the son of a guy who's in one of the greatest films of all time? <laughs> because the thing is, like you said, it bombed. It was like, it came mm. out like the same weekend as E.T. or something ludicrous like yeah. that around the same time. And it was like, it's so good. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it was in an era where like you would get the critics be like, it's just gross. How could look at that all that gross body horror stuff? But like nowadays, you said you said you're at Rob Bottin's place, and I just got like chills down the back of my spine because yeah. that's like some of the greatest practical effects in movies that you just got to. That's what see still behind. when I watch movies now, there's something too synthetic. All the CGI, and it's interesting. Space. We were, yeah, I think one of the first shows to use so much CG early sort of the early evolutions of CGI. Um, but I, in general, still like disaster movies that have models. I just saw the new Godzilla, um, which I think I'm sure a lot of that was CGI. I wasn't paying attention, but that was pretty well done. But just to see like cityscapes destroyed if, when really good models, there's something that just feels more realistic or I don't know. There's something about the digital stuff that I, I'm kind of sick of in movies now when I go. It's all, you're watching an animated movie more than an actual film, you know? Um, yeah. Nothing quite replicates the weight of an actual thing in existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, so and I think with a thing, it was so nihilistic. It was so dark. It was, it was so much about, I mean, I actually, I watched a few of the ones I hadn't seen of Carpenter's. I saw that trilogy of his, I guess it's the thing, the mouth, the, the, in the mouth of madness and then uh, Prince of darkness, which are just, they're great. Um, but I think that sense of that lack, nobody trusted any anybody and there was no women anywhere. It was just all these men who were paranoid the, and The and closest violent. you get is Carpenter threw in Adrian Barbeau as a voice of a it's computer. Voice, right, like, right, right, right. Yeah, and she's my wife. Her, I'll put her in there somehow. Yeah, and then he calls her a bitch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like brutal. And then the, the, the ending is so great of just the two of them just staring at each other, just not knowing what's going to happen. The same thing with... Uh, I had a friend who worked on Blade Runner, my uncle actually, and his friend Hampton Fancher, who wrote the original screenplay, and then the new one. My uncle was sort of working with him when he was writing Blade Runner. So I sort of saw that. I went, then we went to see it, and and then that bombed too. You know, it was the same thing. There was something kind of, it was very dark. And we were, we voted Reagan in. It was like Reagan times here. So nobody <laughs> wanted any of that. The 70s were over, all of that like malaise. They wanted to move on and sell stocks and buy uh buy hot cars you know so with your acting experience it's kind of like a generational thing like your dad was in the industry he did some of these movies you got to go behind the scenes of some of them like you were saying about the thing but 
when it came to like you stepping up to the plate and and being an actor like was it was it movies tv ads theater like what was like what was your kind of like your first entry point into it and like it was theater yeah theater my so my father was involved in this theater festival that happened every summer it was started with um some well-known playwrights, Sam Shepard was one of the initial people that started it. Uh, Maria Irene Forness, um, John Stepling, who actually went on to write some films. He wrote uh, 52 Pickup. I don't know if you've seen that. That uh, basically a film noir written by um, uh, that great old crime writer. I'm blanking on his name, but but uh, some great playwrights. And they they basically would teach young students would come for a couple of weeks. They'd teach them. They would do readings of the students' uh, works or, in pro, you know, in the process of writing these works, the students would put on uh, readings with these actors, this pool of actors that would come that included my father. And then at the end, the more established playwrights would do two nights of live theater outdoors. So orig originally it was done out in Pomona, um, in the hills there um, at this great old, like, um, it was kind of like a, it had a theater, it was this estate that kind of would host, I guess they would host weddings and all sorts of things, but it had a, a theater and all these outdoor areas. And that was where the, the first several years it was done. And then we stayed in, in uh, some motels initially, and then we were hosted at uh, different colleges out in Pomona, which is basically like an hour east of uh of los angeles so if you can imagine my dad like in his 30s and all these crazy actors and playwrights being being put up in in uh college dorms in the summer and just <laughs> made, imagine the kind of behavior in the 80s that was going on there so that was sort of that was what i was around with uh some younger kids of some of the the playwrights and actors that i i hung out with uh there but that was kind of my summer camp and then i was actually put in, I started doing some of those plays. They started utilizing the kids that were around. Um, so that was basically the eighties. I did a play there <coughs> with um, actually the son of Sam Shepard. And then this girl uh, who was a daughter of, of one of the actors there who was, ended up being my girlfriend. I, I was living with her when I was shooting space many years later. That's a whole other long story. So <laughs> we did a play, that play that we did um, it was kind of like a, a, a charming, sort of bittersweet, like comical, but kind of, uh, kind of, yeah, beautiful, thoughtful little piece about these kids going to this thing called the spunk hole, which is sort of a little swamp and encountering this weird kind of homeless guy. And he was, you know, it's experimental 80s LA theater and LA actually had a great theater uh, scene at that time. So and we got some great reviews. I mean, we got like really good write-ups. So I was like, I guess 12 or 13 at the time. And um, <clears throat> so I guess that was the first time where I actually got attention. I'd done it a few years previous at that, at that uh, festival. Um, and I remember my dad coming to me and like going, wow, you know, you got some great writers when I kind of had this like ambivalent attitude about it. <laughs> you know, he, would, <laughs> he, he sort of couldn't figure out what my problem was. Um, <laughs> that that kind I think of I had, cynical I, teen I think I had attitude. A, what's that? That cynical teenage young attitude of like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm doing it. Like, it's fine. Incipient. Yeah. Teen, teenage attitude. Um, but I, I think I also had seen already, um, you know, Brad Davis, who, who was in Midnight Express with my dad, you know, he, he, he had real troubles with substances and stuff. Uh, so I, I was, I was around that. I had a sense of what kind of acting in Hollywood and not that life. Um, and even people who were successful, the kind of, um, trials and tribulations that could happen. So maybe that was part of that. I don't know, but I didn't really get in high school. I was into skateboarding and hanging out at the beach on the weekends in my teen years. So, so acting, I wasn't into musicals. That was my bag. So high school, uh, yeah, acting. So uh, you were really upset that space didn't do a musical episode. Didn't if do you a got musical. to keep going. And... There's still time now. There's still <laughs> time. <laughs> Tuck, is awesome. Tuck, Tuck is grabbing out the guitar. Yeah. He's ready. <laughs> um, Why not? He's good I'm sure to go. Joel can sing and probably dance. He can do it all. 
He can do it all. He 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 told us a bit that you were a bit of a, a skater guy. Like, oh yeah, you know, he's a bit of an LA skater guy. I'm like, oh sure, yeah. I can believe that. And with space, how did you get involved in this? Like, what was the process of you getting the the gig thrown your way and the whole entire auditioning of it? Because you're the the you're, at the very start at least you're the you're the main guy of this newly led Fox sci-fi show written mm-hmm. by people from X Files. So what was the entire like run of getting into all of that was like for you? Yeah, um, it was Randy Stone who cast it. He cast uh, Duchovny and Gillian Anderson in X Files. So that was kind of you know he knocked it out of the park from that. So I think Fox. Uh, or at least Glenn, Glenn and, and Jim knew him uh, from that. And, and I think they were looking for that kind of, you know, interesting casting that wouldn't be the sort of norm, wouldn't be the what the joke was, at least when the pilot was airing. And I think just sort of, they, they, they called it Melrose Space because it was Fox, you know? <laughs> uh, I think that was it. I don't think it was Space 90210. I think it was Melrose Space. I was trying to... <laughs> jog my memory today about that. Yeah, it was Melrose space. Um, they didn't, yeah, they didn't want to be cheesy, um, a cheesy Fox sort of commercial spin on this thing. Yeah, I'm sure you talked, talking to, to uh, Joel and, and James, and I don't know if you read like interviews with Glenn and them, but I mean, their inspirations were Red Badge of Kurt. They're basically doing a, they, they didn't consider it a sci-fi show which actually was a problem because this was the early days of the internet, which I wasn't on yet, but I would hear, I would hear about, you know, the fans or the non fans on the internet, just trashing my character. I would sort of hear some of the stuff come back. Um, luckily I didn't have to read it myself. I wasn't online yet. I wasn't, you know, one of the, the first lines of uh, chat, the chat rooms and all that stuff, but I would hear about that stuff. But I was also here that, you know, the sci-fi fans, they were annoyed that they wouldn't, Glenn and Jim weren't just throwing them little bones. You know, the things you do on a show of like, just explain why why there's gravity on the Saratoga, just these simple things that they like to do. And and I think initially (laughs) Glenn and Jim were just like, yeah, this is not, this is Red Badge of Courage. This is, um, what are the other things? The Naked and the Dead and, you know, all these kind of classic, um, really dark, cerebral sort of war um literature and and i guess there was what was the the like 60s war tv show like combat or something like that yeah 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 which yeah like having watched space i went back and saw some of combat and it's like oh yeah this is like ray bots this episode or this is like this and what you just said it's so funny people still still get a little bit anger- angered at the lack of those little sci-fi things with space. Mm-hmm. And it's like, to me and to us going through it, it's very clear what it is. Like Nathan West in particular, like even your look in the pilot, it's like, oh, this isn't supposed to be like your Star Trek lead. This is supposed to be the lead in a 1940s war movie where this guy's after his girl, but he can't get his girl. So he's going to take it up to those, you know, those, in this case, aliens instead right. of, you know, the, the, the Germans or the Russians it's, it's or whatever. Monty Clift in space or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, what was, there was something else there. Uh, I wanted to, s- yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, it, it's, I haven't seen it in a long time. You guys seen it recently. I mean, I think it was, they really pulled off some interesting ballsy things. I mean, that one episode where there's no dialogue was just like, that must have, the, the studio must have just said, what in the hell are you guys doing? Very rarely does a first season of a show pull tricks like that. You usually wait like a couple of seasons in to do yeah. that. Like even X Files waited a couple of seasons in to do their Brady Bunch episode. Like you know right. they wait a little bit. Yeah, before. Glenn and Jim were were pretty punk rock. They they had a real punk ethos, and they kind of like to to uh, go off the reservation. Oh, this this is what it was. So I I did an episode of China Beach. I don't know if you remember this show. It was a good show, um, and I never see it like rerun or syndicated or mentioned much, but it was a, a great like early nineties, like Vietnam sort of uh, 
not mash because it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't really comedy, but it had that kind of uh, critique of the Vietnam War and, and everything. And so I did a, a pretty great character that I executed pretty well in that, who was this uh, basically shell-shocked young guy. And I think Glenn saw some clips of that. And um, and I think he went, when he was casting and, and the, the studio was like, you know, wanting to cast more sort of sort of hunky type actors than myself, you know, um, he, he would show them that video and go, this is what we want to do on the show. You know, we're not trying to do Starship Troopers, which I guess hadn't come out yet, but uh, which I didn't get that actually until later when I saw it, you know, I didn't get that Verhoeven's very interesting, but all, it, that really is just this sort of critique of like fascism and sort of war and everything. I, I don't know that most people even got it when it first came out. Yeah, it flew over a lot of people's heads, but nowadays yeah. it's like, it's so blatant. It's like, yeah. like how much more blatant do you have to be? But critics back then and people just were like, oh, it's another big action sci-fi mm. movie. And it's like, right. well, they didn't stop to value. think about it. Yeah. They see big bugs and want to make that the attack. And with the pilot episode, uh, we're very interested to hear some tales about that because, Rachel, I mean, you, you can tell us all. I mean, we all know where the Australians here. Yeah. The pilot was down here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we almost, they were talking about filming the series there. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I think, was it... I think James and Joel both mentioned how it was really great to film in Surfer's Paradise, but there was a bit of a worry about, are they actually going to film the show here? Are we going to move to Australia for like six, seven years to do this show? Because our contracts say that we have to. (laughs) It ended Uh, up 20 minutes from my house. I just had to drive in the morning just down down Venice Boulevard. Yeah, it was great. uh, But what was it like filming... Yeah, what was it like filming the the pilot? And do you have any stories of on set or offset? Yeah, just trekking around Australia. We no, it was. Uh, yeah, I mean, what did we do? Like, uh, we went, when we took some time off, we a bunch of us went. When, I think when they were focusing on on a Rodney. The rest of us, Lanai, Joel, and Kristen and I, we, we went to Noosa. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we bopped down there. Uh, Kristen was driving, <laughs> and it was the other side of the road. And I think Joel has video of me just in the backseat, terrified, because <laughs> Kristen was riding. She was riding, you know, the edge of the of the, of the the road, you know, bump, 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 bump. And I was just sort of like, all right, well, maybe, we'll, maybe I'm going to die in Australia. Okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, just the sets, it was sort of when we got there, we, we had, uh, we realized the budget that they were putting into this thing was kind of amazing. Um, and, uh, they had this DP who was excellent. I forget, forget everybody's name, but I mean, I, it just sunk in what a, what a big deal this was and what a chance we had to make something great. Um, we initially got put in, I just want to thank Kristen, you know, we got there and they had us in these, you know, it was a decent hotel, but there was no, no kitchen area or anything. And Kristen just, Kristen just immediately was like, no, no, this is not going to cut it. <laughs> so she got us all to, we were like, okay, oh, we can complain. Oh, uh, so she got us in these nice condos. So we, we, we could spend two months in a, in a little more uh, comfort. Um, we did, we did some training um, I think it was one day, I forget, I, a lot of this stuff was vague memories, but we went out, we had like a drill instructor. It was definitely Joel. I think all of us were there. Um, and, and even this, the sort of more peripheral cast, like PAGs and everybody, uh, even the people that didn't make it, uh, back to America to be on the show, we were all out. Um, getting screamed at and running around. I, I think we had like mock rifles and they made us dro- run and then drop to the ground. And I had no pads on. I, I banged my knees up, but I was, we were just all committed to it. Like, let's do this. Let's try and get this, you know, as much of this military type bonding going. Um, they made us jump off this big tower into a little pond or something. Um and Quantum Leap didn't yeah. get you to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> What's that? Quantum Leap didn't make you do stuff like that. No, no, I'd never. Yeah, it was real like Full Metal Jacket uh, 
yeah, level stuff. Um, I do, I do wish I'd like thinking back, I see how I haven't watched the show in a while. <clears throat> um, but I wish we, I had known more. I, I actually go shooting sometimes with friends. I have some friends who are like ex-military and, and SWAT people. So I sort of understand more now, like, and now movies, I, I'm sure, you know, John Wick and all these shows, everyone's super into this hyper-realistic way of how you, you know, act tactical with weapons and all this stuff. And some of the, some of the ways that we moved in formation as a group was just not, not very uh, co coherent. It's very funny because we talked to James about like, you know, the training and military stuff and he just, just shook his head. It was like, nap didn't need, nap, not, that's not my process. I just play the part. I don't give it, I gotta, that's not important to me, any of that. It's like, and it's oh, true. Oh, like, no sort of research into the, the military mentality or anything? It doesn't seem so. He just is like, I've read the script and I, I just went for it. <laughs> yeah, and he'd done a, at least a couple of military roles before that as well. So I think he was just like, ah, so I've done this before. His father wasn't, he's not like an army brat or anything, was he? Cause I no, have no, his, no, James, well, James Morrison, no. We ask him about this stuff. He's like, no, Tucker, like Tucker has his experiences mm. in the military, but. Um, there's, we, there's actually something I could say. I, I regret, there was Thomas Wright who directed some of the really, he directed uh, Stay With The Dead which is a big one for me. Um, and the several of the other episodes, Glenn and Jim really liked him and brought him back. He was a Vietnam vet. Um, and, and, uh, I got the sense like he was really like, a he was in there. He saw some action and stuff. And then also I knew that Tucker had been to Vietnam, but I sort of regret not kind of picking their, their brains more and just kind of getting that sort of firsthand direct experience of just how to, how to play certain things and just, yeah, just exploiting, um, those assets we had right on set. And, you know, we were just young, man. I just look back on a lot of the time. We, we, uh, I mean, we definitely knew we were lucky, but we also just, we were punks, I'm sure. I'm sure we annoyed the hell out of Glenn and Jim and, and the, the producers sometimes. Um, I mean, we never copped big attitudes or anything. We weren't like a problem, but I just, um, I think about that. Uh, like I should have talked to Tucker more and just, um, yeah. But that's the stuff that you, 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 there's so much things that you had to contend with because this is looking at your career through just the I, IMDb, like the, you, you're still starting out, you're still getting like just one and done roles. And then this is like the big break. You are not only a series regular, but you are the person that is the face of the show. Like your character is the mm -hmm. protagonist. And as someone, you know, as an, as a, as an actor, as someone who's been around the block a few times before this, like, what was it like for you to kind of have that new type of uh, role to play where you're now an ongoing in a TV show and you're a leading one. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure. I, you know, there, there was, when they tested the pilot, my character was not doing like not testing well with the, the test audiences, you know? So there was a little bit of that pressure of like, um, and Glenn and Jim, I think, understood that that uh, a lot of it was the writing, you know, that this was the sort of heart of the show. But some of the writing was a little, especially in the pilot, it was a little corny, a little, little sentimental. It was a little soft. And my mistake as an actor was not wasn't I should have just played against it because the roles I had sort of done before were a lot of these kind of intense, adolescent, emotional sort of uh, roles. And and so. I had that natural kind of sensitivity and emotional um, availability, but as the lead on a show, especially when the character's written that way already, I should have definitely played harder in the other direction to it. So there was, yeah, there was some pressure, at least for me, that I felt to kind of um, get the character back on track. So when we got back to the States and we're shooting, um, there was clearly that that agenda with the way they wrote it and how they in the storylines they took my character on, but still wanting to use, you know, my what my strengths are to an extent of like like stay with the dead. I mean, I think there was some really great. I love the, I love those scenes where I'm they they have me hooked to that machine. It's like uh, what's what's the thing at the end? Like they have me 
You're like um, covered in blue goo. Like you're laying in like. Right, a but there's bed. like a screen up to my face. Oh, so it's it's basically uh, yeah, like yeah. you're getting lobotomized. Yeah, general, basically, general anesthetic, but through like an array of some kind, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had like some yeah. plastic visor on your face, and you're talking. But that was just fun to play. I remember just playing that and playing that sort of intensity of like, I've got to get this information across to McQueen. I got to convince him, but I'm also being put to sleep by this ray gun. It was just a very fun, you know. Pr- uh, dynamic to play as an actor um but to also give him i mean basically to give him some balls to just not have it just be about whining about it just being such a selfish little prick right (laughs) yeah i mean that i mean we we debated about this on the pod and we've had conversations it's so weird with west because you see this in a lot of shows especially when they begin the protagonist they just kind of they don't know the voice of it or they don't know the exact way to do it. But with, with West, it's so peculiar because they on purposely make him a, like an asshole, like a prick. Like in the pilot episode and several others afterwards, he will say things that are like, you are not supposed to like him. Like he will be like, I'm for rights. I'm for equality. As long as they don't intrude upon my equality. And it's like, yeah. Did I say that? Is that yeah, what that's, I- yeah. that's in the pilot where it's like, I'm for tanks rights, of course. But as long as it doesn't intrude upon mine. I said tanks, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you said something like <laughs> oh, that. Man. Because the whole thing yeah. was West was you know, all Mr. I'm all for equality. Me and my girlfriend are really cool. Yeah. But you're kicking me off the mission. and so, For a tank? For a Screw tank. Screw you. <laughs> Screw you. Like, and, yeah, now, that, now it's coming back. I mean, Because at first when you said that, they intentionally made him a, an asshole. I'm like, no, re- no. But then I'm like... Yeah, I mean, I have that. There's that one line where I yell at, at Rodney. I said, "What would you know about it, Tank?" Which is basically like the N word. I mean, it was, yeah. and that was really what Glenn, Glenn and Jim were working on. That it's like there's all these. You have the the AIs. You have you have the uh, in vitros, and there's all this. There's still this prejudice because all the other sort of racisms have been weeded out of society, right? But there's these these holdover ones of yeah. So I mean. They really were playing with some interesting um, ideas, and so yeah, they did. I'm, it's you're right. They they it's they really wanted me to be an asshole and somehow <laughs> likable at the same time, which is a hard thing to do as an actor. Yeah, but I do like they they got better with it as the series went along, and I think uh, a lot of people including myself really struggle to like West at all and it's just like this guy this guy um did you have a similar experience of like liking West as he evolved or were you always like this this is my guy yeah I mean all characters you have to kind of find some connection to them some some you have to love them in some way even if they're really screwed up it's like you can't you can't play evil i mean if you're playing hitler or you're playing anything you have to believe that this person nobody nobody acts out of evil in life right i mean i guess sociopaths are they have a lack of empathy but there's i think most people are doing they rat we rationalize uh the worst actions to to um because we think we're doing the right thing, you know, ultimately, I think. And I think that's the way, because as an actor, that's, you can't, again, you can't play evil. That's, that's like playing mood as an actor. It's just, it's, it kills the whole thing. So, um, but he was, yeah, I mean, he was like me in a lot of ways. He, he was generally like, I would be in that situation. It's like thrown into, I mean, we went into, we went through it in, in 9-11, you know, it's like you're thrown into this whole war and all this sort of bombastic nationalistic fervor. And then you start to um, question narratives at a certain point, which I guess they get into later in the show. You know, I, I haven't watched this all such a long time, but I think I was listening to you, you guys talk about the the last two episodes and they were really bringing up some interesting ideas of like what, what was the aliens agenda and, and what, what was, uh, what was our culpability in things. And uh, man, I just have to say, I don't know if you've been noticing what's going on over here with like the Congress and the UFO talk and all this stuff. It's getting (laughs) really. And that's the interesting thing about really bananas. That's the interesting thing when we you kind of look back on space in the time period. 
it was a war show made during a time where there wasn't a, a, like a war currently really on. There was one like uh, what, what was the war before with America like uh, several years earlier, and then then nine eleven a while after. And you look at it, and there it is in this like little vacuum of time where it's after some stuff and before some other stuff, and. With with West, yeah, we had lots of conversations about that character and his and his journey because it is a it is on purposely in at least my eyes and I think Rachel went on to agree they on purposely made him difficult in many ways because it's like he's our lead he's doing all of these noble things but he's such a prick about it but throughout the entire show like even in early episodes your character would recognize their shortcomings and actually try and work on them like the first episode rachel and i hated which is the first proper episode where you just steal a ship and fly off right, <laughs> just right yeah do a thing but then two what episodes, a selfish asshole yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then two episodes later you walk like west walks up to mcqueen and has a whole conversation about how selfish that was and how bad that was and so it's always like this boomerang effect of they would make west recognizable but also just such an arrogant guy and for yourself, like, how do you feel about the growth of this character, the the journey he went on, the way that he was positioned, and then where he ended up as the guy who was only looking out for himself to the person who was willing to be a member of the team? Yeah, I mean, I think he. It's that impulsive. I mean, it's such an unfair thing that we send young men to to fight these wars because they're still. I mean, I've just. You know, men, I think they're saying we're, our brains aren't really finished the evolving until we're 25. But, you know, most of these people go to fight these wars at 18 and 19 when you still think you're basically invincible. Um, and so there's that impulsivity, that impulsiveness that I think West character kind of, um, you know, Glenn was working and Jim were working on with that character, just that youth and that that idealism i think the character is really about the idealism and that and the 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 faith and belief in in um in in the duty of like yeah of going on and 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 uh saving humanity i guess you know fighting for this ultimate do or die moment you know which an alien attack would seem to be um so like yeah, like anything, it's it shows are like uh, well war or or medical shows, right? It's always these heightened environments um, to play to play these dramas out. But to your your question of um, my character, I uh, I enjoyed it um, for the most part. It was just frustrating to feel like I was behind the eight ball and trying to win back. Because initially, you know, it really was. He was the main character. When they first came to me, I wanted to play the cooler. You know, I wanted to do the Hawks character or whatever. And they're like, no, no, we want you for this one. Um, and But it really was, as it was written, basically, the sort of lead and the heart, the sort of heart of the show. Because he was, again, this more idealistic um, character. But also, they made him complicated, which I think is credit to Glenn and Jim, to make him challenging to watch for you. It's not just the squeaky clean character who's never annoying or never selfish. They wanted to do something more realistic and showing that that kind of selfishness and impulsiveness in that environment gets people killed, you know? Um, so I guess that was part of it too. I was a, a mechanism to bring up those questions of like, how do you, how do you balance that youth and idealism and that vigor and, and that, invincibility which helps you win wars with the other side of that which is like you got to train these people and, and uh beat the asshole out of out of them which is what they ended up doing that's what we ended up doing we we beat the asshole out of west and he kind of uh yeah he learned i guess he learned right over that season he became something a little uh, less annoying and and um you could relate to him more but yeah no i was i was very i was i definitely feel like for me regarding that character um we got him to a good place and the show as as a whole i think again i haven't watched it in a long time but i'm just like it's hard i mean you just see that it's hard to 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 
every week you're, or, you know, a little more than a week, you're, you're making a new episode of something. And sometimes the script's not always there. It was really interesting early on. There was a few of the episodes like, um, what was the one where we go to the, the planet where it's, it's basically like the zone. It's like Solaris or something. It's like affecting us with our fears. The, the our enemy, stuff. the enemy. Yeah. So that one, the script, there was parts that were just weak. We, we would, on some of the early episodes, we'd all meet up together at one of our houses and read through the script. And there were beats in that script and transitions, you know, to, that would go to a commercial and then start up later that just didn't work. So we would, we would, we mentioned that to Glenn and Jim and they let us come up with, you know, we gave them some ideas of how it worked better and, uh, and they went with it. So it was, yeah, it was cool. There was a lot of sort of collaboration, a sense of that they were open to our ideas. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear more about that aspect of the show, that sense of like um, having input in the show in general and maybe specific to your character as well. Yeah, the relationship with with the writers and and the directors because I, I think like when space gets talked about, it's very much about the network came in and fucked up the show or was against the show, and there's like all of these hassles. But when you actually sit down and watch the show, there's there's still something on the screen there. Like you can see there's a coherency and everything like keeps adapting as it goes along. Like that was our biggest compliment was for a first season, especially of a science fiction show. It kept adapting and and reacting to to input somehow. Like I don't know if if input was coming in just from you actors or, or from the audience or whatever. But like like with West's character, there was like reactions to it. So what was? Oh, your... there, yeah, there was some input. <laughs> <laughs> but like with you uh, and others, like was there what was the relationship like with with the the writers and and the directors and stuff when it came to like giving your two cents on things. Uh, yeah, well, the writers it was more when Glenn and Jim, who wrote some of them, I don't remember which ones, but they and they were, of course, overseeing the whole thing. So there was basically shaping it. I don't remember any direct like interactions with the writers specifically because I think they were executing an overall concept and and arc for the series. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's again my memory, and that was er- this, the earlier episodes. There was, um, I think with my character, I, I think this is true. I, I think Glenn told me once that they were initially, the, the studio wanted to just kill my character off. I think they were like, this character is not liked. We should just whack him. And I think, I think Glenn and Jim were just like, no, this is our fault. Morgan's a good actor. We're gonna, we'll figure this out. I don't know. You could ask them if you ever talked to them, but that was the rumor I heard. Um, and that was probably in the beginning when the testing from the uh, the pilot was, you know, people, I was not the favorite character. Um, so, so yeah, there was definitely, uh, in those early episodes, I just remember it was a very, you know, I never had that on any TV show or, or little movie I worked on where, where they were, it was a collaborative thing in that sense. And I, and I really, cause I'm good at, I'm good at things like that. I'm good at, I'm a decent writer. And I think I just have a good sense of what, when things don't work, how you can sort of tweak little, little, you know, lines or, or of dialogue or just transitions or, and scenes and things. I have a pretty good mind for that kind of stuff. So it was just great um, to see that we could help make it better um, when things weren't perfect, but that's, yeah. I mean, it's just like, it was wild to see, as much money and, and resources as, as they had at their beck and call, it's just hard to make something good week after week, episode after, and after episode. And I think um, there are definitely, I don't know, what do you guys say? Like, it sounds like there's, I, I'd say there's a handful of episodes in that season that are pretty much up there as far as how good definitely a sci-fi show can be. Yeah, and, I definitely. And like gra- groundbreaking, you yeah. know? Innovative. There, there, are, there are several, and when looking back at the like TV landscape, the series itself holds a very interesting place. Where the things that you you like, the series was getting at, 
weren't really the norms, weren't really happening. And then later on with stuff like Battlestar Galactica and and uh, The Expanse and so on, it would just become more of a regular thing. Like with, with West, for instance, I feel like that character could work nowadays because there's like, a, I don't know, like there's a level of expected patience for the audience to have for characters to be unlikable to it's eventually It's no longer change. the expectation that you have to like the lead. Mm, mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean that they're always like an anti-hero. You Sometimes they are still the hero. Are complicated. But... Yes. <laughs> yes. People are complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, I just want to say is West was my favorite character in the wild cards in the 50th. I have to say Commodore Ross is my favorite character in the show. But in terms of the wild cards, and I think a, a huge part of it is it's the, he, he's such a he's such a like he he really makes you feel a lot of things and think a lot of things he goes through so much and he gets like he he gets broken down and built back up by his experiences in this war and i do wonder what it was like having to connect with that experience filming the show Oh, oh i can tell you so so i for Stay with the Dead, I totally forgot this. I was, <laughs> I I was in my room watching like Faces of Death video. I mean, I was I think I had a video of like Chechen Chechen war footage, you know, like really really brutal stuff. And I was just sort of in my darkened little dressing room watching watching that kind of stuff. And I I mean I had done intense like acting where you had to like deliver on some emotional bars and stuff before, like I've been acting for several years. Um, but I think, I think I was still in this, in this mindset of like that I had to, I was there, I had this self-indulgent ideas about acting back then that if I didn't completely lose myself while we're shooting it and believe it myself to a certain extent, then it was shit. Right. And that's just not true. I mean, there's there's just there's an element of acting that's that's technical and that is you can you can make decisions and hit things that you need to do um, as far as uh, emotionality and intensity and, and, and darkness and accessing all these aspects of human experience and behavior without having to. Uh, yeah, to do that. Then again, you know, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, I was never a method actor, but there's, you know, there, there it's in, in the end, it's whatever works. It's, it's, I have worked with Charles Dance once, you know, that great British actor. I did a movie with him in Puerto Rico and he talked about working with, I don't know if it was Ben Kingsley or someone, but he's, he, I remember him just saying, it's so great. He's so great to just throw the ball back and forth with. And that's really like acting is just that whatever gets you, confident in yourself, whether it's, I love to make backstories for characters and fill out the biography and do all that stuff. Cause I want to believe it, not just because I think it does inform my acting, but it's just more interesting and fun instead of like some teachers nowadays that, and always all along there, it's just sort of like you, you, uh, you actually put a piece of your own life experience in, in, into something, right. You know, um, like your dog died or whatever to get to an emotional state. And to me, that's just more, it's sort of weird and clinical and, and, and uh, disconnected. So, so I always thought of that when Charles Dan said that, just like whatever process gets you to just be comfortable and believe in the reality of the circumstances and then just be in the moment and throw the ball back and forth with another actor or a few actors. And that's it. Cause that's really, it's listening and reacting and, and surprising each other. Um, and I was lucky. I mean, the actors, everybody on that show um, was great. I mean, he, like Rod, Rodney was not a super experienced actor, but you watch some of the stuff he did on that show and it's like, it's, it's great because he was so in it and so working so hard and so open to, uh, I mean, that's just such a great character too. What a, what a, I think that was why I was drawn to that initially too is like what is it like to play all that weird behavior and him yeah, all because this, yeah. with, he's, he's with him and Morrison you know he's like trying to learn it's like what 
a little I'm trying to learn to be a little boy. You know? <laughs> yeah, because he's he's the sci-fi character in, in this in this show where it's like mm. at first he comes across as like the typical 1950s hot head bad boy James right, Dean the type. Bad boy, right. But, but then just, he doesn't know what the hell's going on. But then mm-hmm. by the time you get into the show, it's like, oh no, he's six years old. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like the unique fun stuff. And he's like, he doesn't know what Christmas is, and we have to explain Christmas <laughs> to him. And and like that's like Wes a special shows him stuff. how to talk to girls on the uh yeah. Yeah. What was that? What was that? Uh, was oh. that is that in R&R? Was it the yeah, R&R, yeah, yeah. With R&R, Coolio. Yeah. <laughs> because, like, one of the things uh, I like is so clear from this show, like, so clear, and, and it's been very much uh, backed up by talking to you and others, is there's such a closeness between all of you and the cast. Like, this ensemble in the show has to be close because... This isn't like Star Trek where there's a A story and a B story and then the B story has these actors over here in the A story. Space, Everybody's every- in the same room. Mm-hmm. Everybody's in the set and like it feels like a lot of the time like you all just seem to be stuck there. Like even if you have lines or not because like the spaces are small. <laughs> so it's yes. just like somebody's yeah, always in the background. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah, close quarters, body odors, yeah, dirty faces. Yeah. And I was just uh, wanting to hear a bit more about like your your relationship and your your dynamics with with the people like on a, on a, on like an acting level and even a personal level because it definitely is the the key of space above and beyond is the chemistry that the cast have even between characters who do not like each other eventually mm-hmm. they have to grow to like each other and we at home have to believe that and i think that was one of the key things to me watching it and podcasting about it was noting down like you actors just seem to really click. So could you tell us a bit more about we, that? We, all, we always got along. Yeah, there was there was never any uh, any beefs like my experience. I don't know. You could talk to I, my memory. There was no there was no. Uh, yeah shit fits pulled or prima donna act- activity um I- i'll tell you one story though about joel i don't know if joel told you this story but <laughs> 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 we did annoy each other occasionally so, <laughs> yes. so it was it was towards it was one of those last episodes there's a i think it might have been one of the last two there's a a massive like jungle planet I don't know. Yes, was, yes. There was yes. this. I mean, we had these. The money they spent on this show was just. And this was when they knew it was going to ca- get canceled. And 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 Glenn and Jim were like, "Fuck it, it's our money. Let's just do it." Right. <laughs> so, so they they had this mat like full size soundstage with just just this entirely landscape like like alien jungle planet. And me and Joel were sitting with all of our gear and the helmets on, waiting for a shot. We used to we used to just hit each other's helmets sometimes to to mess with each other, and I think Joel was just had had enough. He was not in a great mood, and I like I whacked his helmet, and he just took a pile of this like of this this set dressed Earth, you know, like alien planet dirt, and just threw it, and my mouth was open, <laughs> so just all in my eyes and my mouth and everything. <laughs> That's great. That's and great. I was just like Jesus, overreact much, and I stormed away, and then uh, we, got, we got over it. <laughs> because there is a, there is a like. But as, that sounds like a very like that's a sibling thing to do. Of like we mess with yeah. each other all of the time, and then somebody just cracks it one day. That's yeah. what I really loved about West. Near the end, is you became the brother figure of the show like you would sit with rodney and you're his older brother telling him how to get with ladies and it's kind of funny because we know west and his relationship with women is just so weird and like all like there's dorky. only one yeah exactly like years away and you're gonna <laughs> join a war to go get her but then you can sit next to the handsome hunky guy with the cool haircut and like the j all crew that. model i'm gonna tell the j crew model how to how to meet girls yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it works because you've been so humbled at that point it's kind of nice to see west just be like a supportive person instead of the one yeah. who like takes a ship and says screw you guys i'm gonna get my girl and i don't care but with um yeah and you can tell there's a cheekiness in the set because as it goes along they include little things like 
the Joel, impression. Joel's impression of McQueen is one of the fan favorite things. I mean, I think that's a, this is a norm of any show that's that's sharp and really paying attention uh, and finding its feet. Is you you when you all grew through that stage of how the show finds its tone and everything, and how the characters find their voice, and the writers with them help help that. But then you start to go. And we had interesting, we're all interesting people, interesting actors, talented people with interesting lives. So, and, and just the relationship we develop on set, Glenn and, and Jim were watching that. And so they start putting our own personal foibles and interactions and, and sort of, uh, yeah, ticks and quirks into the characters. So there was definitely plenty of that. Um, and that just made it better. Yeah, because I think as a, as a viewer, there's something that comes out that's very authentic about that. And, the, and definitely a sibling relationship was was on set wise and, and definitely on the show yeah that west was able to kind of stop being such an uptight twit and sort of connect with uh with people and even tanks <laughs> yeah do you think the fact that so many of you were relatively fresh in the industry regardless of age uh also influenced that sort of sense of bonding I mean, yeah, it was, this was uh, a huge opportunity for all of us. I mean, it was just kind of, I don't, I mean, the ra- you know, the ratings, we struggled. A lot of it was about the ratings. A lot of it was this political battle with Glenn and Jim and the studio. And I think Murdoch really liked the show. That probably had more to do with that it was all about war, and he probably loved that. But he, I knew that Murdoch was a fan, but there was all these other players who – thought it was too expensive and wanted, wanted this money for their, you know, projects and everything. And, and then it was about, again, like the show that Glenn and Jim want to make, which was this, like the X-Files is the same thing, this dark quirky humor and this pathos and this sort of this war. um, Ongoing threads and continuity and development of character. Yeah. Like deep, deep stuff and, and, um, and taking chances narratively and artistically um, and, and I think a lot of the people at the studios just considered it basically like Melrose space. Like, what is it? It's just, okay. And let's put it after football at 7 PM. And it's not really that type of show. So, but the ratings we got back then, which were not great today, they would be like mind blowing ratings. I don't, I don't remember the numbers, but, um, if you ever talk to Glenn and Jim, they'll break all that stuff down to you. Cause it was, it was always, I think they, they used to post the ratings, the, you know, the weekend ratings for us <laughs> when it was on the weekend. So we could have a sense of how we were doing. And, and um, I mean, I guess maybe that added some pressure. I don't remember thinking about that a lot, but we were just kind of trying to uh, yeah, to make quality every week and in spite of ourselves and our, and our youth, but uh, to your question of, yeah, being fresh, most of us in varying levels of experience, but we, I mean, all of the, most of the cast, yeah, we were in our 20s. So it was just kind of mind blowing to walk on these sets and just see all this money they were spending and, and all these great ideas Glenn and Jim were coming up with. Um, and again, like I wish, like we, you know, I, I sort of, you, you get a little lazy and set in your ways because you know, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm this character, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. But I, I remember looking back <clears throat> and just seeing that I could have done more with certain moments and beats, you know, instead of casually, as I think as actors, especially American actors, there's this, there's always this, you know, I, I don't act anymore really, but, but I've, I, I know some actors, I know people who are sort of trying to get into it now and I kind of look at how, what Hollywood's become and the, what they make and it's all very, it's so different when I was young working there, just sort of the role models we had, you know, it was, it was about Brando and Monty Clift and all this, this really this, this sort of groundbreaking inflection points of the artistry and filmmaking and acting and really wanted and, and the commitment to it, you know, which I don't know what, pe- yeah, I don't know that people look to those same types of people or that type of acting so much anymore. What I, I, I see a lot of kind of superficial approaches to things, a, a kind of a different, yeah, different energy. Um, I don't know where I was going with all that. But. <laughs> no, it all makes sense. And you have said, and we have said it too, that 
the the focus in on West shifts and it, and it becomes less of the West show and everyone else and more of the complete ensemble, like everyone mm-hmm. kind of shares the spotlight. And we kind of focused more on Kristen. I remember I was a little b- bitter about that. <laughs> I, remember, I remember an interaction I had in, with Glenn once. Uh, what, what they make her honcho, right? Isn't that the thing? Yeah, like, she, she, becomes, she becomes a captain. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I remember being annoyed. I forget what it was exactly, but there's something about how a scene was written or maybe it was rewritten and it was like throwing the stuff to, to Kristen. There was something interacting with Glenn and, and I just snapped at him, kind of like West style. I was like, well, yeah, she's <laughs> honcho now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you this, I, Glenn is the sweetest guy. He's so he's such a great, like warm hearted, sweet guy. Uh, and I think, you know, West was one side of Glenn, that kind of, you know, sentimental, pure of heart guy. And then he, Glenn's a real punk rocker, too. He comes from like loving punk rock, like Sex Pistols, The Clash and everything. And and uh, and that's what what uh, uh, Cooper's sort of represents that side of him. But I saw Glenn got so mad at me once I was supposed to do. This was still when we were trying to you know build up ratings um, and keep the show going. And I didn't know what any of this meant. It was like a. I didn't know what happened, the reach of this thing, right? But it was a morning interview on a, on a talk radio show and I just overslept. And I didn't, I didn't think, I, I didn't, I was, I was probably a little prick actor about it, but I just didn't think it was going to be such a big deal. Glenn came onto set gl- with, with murder in his eyes and he could barely speak. And he just said, you know better, you know better. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know better yeah. now, right? <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's that's um. Yeah, that's interesting because I I wonder uh, because we were wondering with that change, like, did it upset you as an actor, or did you think it helped you as an actor or help the character? Because for us, the viewer, it helped the character to to lessen the like lessen mm. all of the attention and to spread mm-hmm. it out. Yeah. Uh, well, but, and I think that's also natural for any show. You, like, you always start to spread out because everybody's. Uh, if you really love a show and all the characters are well written and interesting, which I think ours were. Uh, that's the sort of natural arc anyways. But yeah, I think definitely they were pulled back for me a little bit just because we were trying to rejigger the character. And I think, I think at the time, and I don't know how much Glenn and Jim and them were, I imagine they were looking at some of the online chatter and sort of stuff. I think McQueen has always been sort of pound for pound, the most loved character of people that watch the show and that were fans. Um, Maybe then, and then Cooper and Christian, I, I don't know. Cooper's definitely was a very popular. Um, there's fanfic, but, there's fan fiction of McQueen and Cooper. I'll just say that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think J- I got the sense from J- James at one point that he was annoyed with that they weren't, they didn't seem to be getting, he, he didn't seem to feel like he was getting thrown enough in relationship to how popular his character was. And he was a little annoyed about that, which was understandable. Um, But uh, yeah, no, as an actor, I mean, I think, yeah, I I wish I remembered more of that interaction, specifically what it was about with Glenn, but I just remember (laughs) saying that to him, like, yeah, yeah, she's honcho now. But I think I was a little, uh, a little annoyed and maybe a little, you know, a little sensitive about it, but also um, I understood, you know, that we had that we were trying to build build back the likability of this character. And I knew that we were doing it. And I knew that the work I was doing was I was delivering, you know, I think, I think with stay with the dead, it really showed like, that's why they hired me for this show. Cause like I can really do this stuff and this can also sort of expand out the character and give him some depth depth. So he's not just this annoying guy who's pining about his girlfriend and wanting everyone else to care. It's a real episode mm. that turns people around on, on the character and, and really lets you show off, your acting skills. I've had people, we had people watching space with us as we were podcasting about it, family, friends, listeners, Mm -hmm. and everyone had their two cents about Nathan West and how much they don't, didn't and did like him and so on. And then stay with the dead happens. And it's such a, such a big punch to the face. And my brother-in-law was even like, 
this is a show where they could legitimately lobotomize the main character and get away with it. Like, he was like, I was on the edge of my seat during that entire episode because it's possible they could do this to West because mm-hmm. this show is really, yeah. like, adult and would probably do, like, stuff like that. I'm like, oh, wait till you get to the end of the show. <laughs> but the big one is, and I imagine it's Stay With The Dead, but do you have a favorite episode? Is there an episode that you feel like it really worked or you had a great time making it or, or just the script or what you got to do in it? Yeah, I mean, definitely Stay With The Dead was a turn. So there was also, uh, there was a, a crew, there was a, a, a photography crew that was on before. Um, and he he was a he was a cool guy like I liked him but but he was very he wasn't helpful in creating the sort of atmosphere he was sort of dismissive of the show he would he would he was a very talented DP but he kind of um, I think he was a problem also just with the production like maybe they took too long he was his work was very good I don't I haven't watched the show in a while but like Sometimes there was times where you just have to give actors space and quiet and, and sort of, you know, a sanctity, you know, maybe a little bit annoying, but just sort of let actors do their thing. And and sometimes I never remember having some big issue. with him. I liked him again, but I think he was a little bit running to the beat of his own drummer. And so they let him go. And then the new crew came on, DP crew came on, uh, first day with the dead. So there was this sense of like, Oh, we're really, and I think that crew came on and, and they saw what we were doing on that show and they were like, oh, fuck, this is awesome, you know? So there, there was this sense of, of new blood and that we were, were really capable of doing, um, you know, making solid, solid stuff. So, so that, yeah, there's that has a certain uh, sentimentality for me, but there's some of those old, some of the later episodes when you said there was this sense of impending impending doom um, in reality for the show. And then also just for, you know, we didn't know exactly what Glenn and Jim had up their sleeves as they were writing the final episodes, but there was a sense of, yeah, who's going to live. And and um, it was just a cliffhanger all around, you know? So some of those, those later episodes felt like this might be the last time we're doing all this and we're playing, we're playing scenes, um, I remember seeing, you know, playing the scene where I saw, is it Joel's character get, get killed or, or I'm, yeah. I'm like desperately looking out of the window of one of the ships and, uh, and people are dying, you know? And so as an actor, you're kind of also going, yeah, we might not get renewed, you know? So there was, it, there was a weight to it beyond just playing it as an actor. And I think just some of those last, those last two episodes are very interesting. I actually want to watch them again because I forget a lot of the interesting ideas that that were put in about that, you know, about the aliens and their agenda and all that stuff. And the corporate um, business side of it. The like corporate Earth. stuff, yes. Yeah. yes. And the political stuff. Like some of my favorite stuff was when like the UN were involved in a couple of episodes and yeah, like even to to the credit of like the back half of Space Above and Beyond is very strong, but it's also weird. Like you get R and R thrown in there, which is yeah. very much like uh, we have to appease Fox. It feels like he's Coolio. He is yeah. he is that. But then you have the second last episode where there is that sense of well, fuck it, we can do what we like. Let's have forty five minutes of our heroes legitimately debating about committing a war crime. That's the plot. That's the plot. That's the whole entire episode. Is that's it? And which it's was like, that one again? Uh, that's the second last one. Like, um, it's the one with like this run-on sentence where you're on the jungle planet, and and we're just gonna kill. We're gonna yeah. You're worried like, is this alien a chig or are they just some bystander? And should we right. just kill them? <laughs> <laughs> just like the the Milai massacre in space. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, Rachel, what do you what do you want to ask? So we've got a couple of things left here on the docket. Yeah, I I guess were there any actors or directors that you remember really enjoying working with that came on for Thomas, a bit? I remember Thomas Wright, uh, who directed Stay With The Dead and a few others. He was just a, he was just cool. He was a cool guy. Uh, and he was the Vietnam vet and he just, he did, um, I forget the other ones he directed, but I always loved uh, working with him. 
there was a few that were annoying. There was one, I'm not going to name him, but there was a guy who, who called us talking heads. He worked on some other big shows. Like he worked on ER. He was like a big, he was sort of worked a lot. Right. And he came on and he said, bring back the talking heads, like meant bring the actors back. And I think James, I think, I think Morrison said, if he says that, if he says that shit again, this actor is going home for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's crazy. Yeah, Tom's Tom's the main one that I remember. Um, oh, and, and Dave Nutter. Nutter was great. Nutter did the pilot, and so when we were when we were in in uh, Surfer's Paradise, they'd give us we got videos of the the early edit edits of the pilot, and they were also giving us. I wasn't. I hadn't. I actually had, had auditioned or maybe I hadn't, they'd asked me to come in for one of the X-Files things, uh, but I didn't make it in. And I, I knew of the show, but I hadn't really, it hadn't exploded yet. And I hadn't really, I started really watching it working on the pilot. And then with the, and Nutter had directed so many of those. And I was just like, he's so good at that, that creepy, just that really creepy vibe that he could create um, that he did on the X-Files. And he did, uh, in space, just that vibe. He's great at vibes, dark vibes. Yeah, there's, and he, he's, awesome. he's directed a, a bunch of other stuff, and there are some recognizable Game of names. Game Thrones, like, right? A bunch of Game of Thrones? Yeah, David Nutter. Like, he's David Nutter. You look at his career, and it's like, if you want a pilot to succeed, you hire him. Like, that's like, you, you would go through David Nutter's roster, and there was uh, Charles Martin Smith, who Joel really liked because he was also an yes, actor. Yes, 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 yes. Char- Charles was awesome. Yeah, I totally forgot him. Charles was great because, uh, he was an actor. I mean, he he had been an actor, and I and he was a, a kind of iconic in my brain. He I'd already seen him in all these made like classic films. Um, and he would sort of pull us up a few times. We'd be I think we'd be sort of being annoying little shits, you know, just little a- actors sometimes. And he kind of maybe wouldn't know our lines so much, and he'd kind of drop little hints like, you know, maybe you guys should take all this a little seriously. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> might not be happening forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, he was a very, he was a good director and did a, how many did he do? Uh, he, he did, did a, like three, I think two or yeah. three over it. Like yeah, he Glenn, was early Glenn on. And Jim really liked him too. They brought him on a, a few times. Yeah. And with actors, there was just so many people who showed up in space above and beyond just like, you know, in one and done roles or just uh, little minor roles. Were there anyone, were there any of those people that you, you liked working with or maybe even knew beforehand or you worked with since? I had no one came on that I knew uh, previously, um, but all of the, there was the woman who played the corporate person with the earpiece. She's sort of villainous. Like, I, I don't, I don't remember anyone's names, but I mean, the cat, they had, I never had, I never thought, oh, why did they cast this person? They always, they always brought on great people and people that I was, I, many of them, I'd already, I was familiar with their work and seen them and, um, but uh, but I mean that that was just great. He's awesome. That's a fan favorite. Mm. Yeah, I mean that that's just was that episode based on something? But I, was I listening to the episode where you guys were talking about it? Was it like did they take that kind of concept from something else or? Um, I can't recall off mm. the top of my head. I just know that like. Glenn and, and, and Jim would talk about like combat and other shows that like they would like kind of get inspiration mm-hmm. from and you can see that definitely. Like the 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 whole thing about Ray Butts, like that type of character is not unusual for a war story, but with space, I guess it stands out because it was really fun. Like it like it's even though it's sad, it's like he's a pancake guy and he plays paintball. Well, it's fun, but it's also just weird. It's just odd. Yeah. Like, pancake thing is just it's just strange. <laughs> but it's the show. Like we yeah. argue, it's like if, yeah. if you don't like the pancake thing, you're not like gonna like space above and beyond. Like, yeah. No, it's that that very odd. Uh, no, it's unique to Glenn and and Glenn's brother, who I don't think did, he didn't write any any of the episodes, did he? No, he's he's some of those he, X-Files, mainly X Files and uh, yeah, Millennium. I mean, he's got it. I, I met him. I think he. I think Glenn and I went to see the Sex Pistols once, and I think his brother came along there. But I talked to his brother a few times, and I mean, yeah, that, he's got a fascinating brain. I mean, yeah, he's 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 one of the most beloved writers of X Files, and he wrote two episodes of Millennium, and they're the highest rated and most loved episodes of the entire mm-hmm. show. And then he just left. Yeah. 
totally unique. Yeah. And he wrote some of the, the recent series, the X-Files series too, I think, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure too. And I'm pretty sure uh, Glenn has been involved in that and, and even Kristen to an extent too has been involved in that stuff too, the mm-hmm. newer, newer runs of things. Um, the show's very stunt heavy, lots of action, lots of running around, lots of things shooting oh, at you. I got a story for that. Yeah. That's what I wanted to know. Like, Did I imagine- Joel tell you? Joel told us about his scar that he has. Yes. On the back. Yeah, that's so- yeah, so he probably told you that story. I mean, that uh, they line up a bunch of squibs, and and we're supposed to run as the squibs are chasing. You know, the bullet hits are chasing us, and then we dive into a, a a bomb crater, and then these explosions go on around us. And there, this is not CGI days. This is gasoline pans blowing. You know. Uh, it just made it just made me flashback to another another film my dad was on. He was in the Twilight Zone movie. Oh where yes, the, the actor died. He yes. was in that 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 segment of the film. From again, they were blowing like debris up into like the helicopters that they kept saying, "Bring the chopper lower and lower." So, so yeah, we we're running and and the squibs first of all beat us. So the squibs were ahead of us. They're blowing. I had I was blind basically because it blown like dirt and dust into my eyes. We jump into the into this. Um, bomb crater and this massive gasoline explosion. I don't know if it was a couple or one big one, but just this huge gasoline explosion goes off. And right then the wind had changed. We were shooting out like in the the desert or something. And, and so it blew the heat wave right over this, basically like a walk. We were inside a walk (laughs) and, and starting to boil. And we had for a while, I don't know if I still have, but we had a VHS of the dailies of that day. And it was just silent. There was no sound on the clip. But you see me and Joel, and I think Lanai was in there. And and Joel, it was either Joel or Lanai, they thought they were on fire. So I was actually patting their body. And I never got burned, but I felt like this might be getting worse. I never got... uh, I didn't get hurt, but Joel got, I think, a, yeah, a scar, a burn on his head. And and we jump out. It's silent. We jump out and we're like this. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of um, Toy Soldiers, the one where West's brother is there and he and he goes yeah. and comes to die. The like the third act or the final act of that episode is you sprinting through explosions. It's just oh, explosion yeah. after explosion, and it's genuinely terrifying as a viewer because it's it's real. It's real. Yeah, no, it was real. Exp- yeah, no, we did a lot of. I did a lot of. Run. I was young and spry. I was in good shape. We did a lot of uh, running and dropping to the ground, prone and shooting and and uh, emoting. How does that episode hold up? Is it good? Yeah, um, you know, I, 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 I liked it a little less than than Rachel, but it is definitely one that uh, gives West a lot of heft to do. Like that's also a great episode yeah. where where uh, uh, Shane talks to you about like, yeah, you were annoying to begin with, but you're better now, yeah. so you got to accept that your brother's annoying. Mm-hmm. So right. <laughs> that's one of those. But uh, um, with space, it's often talked about. It's even been referenced here that Fox. You know the higher ups. There's you know not big fans. Uh, it's I mean Fox doesn't seem like it was ever fans of science fiction shows. I mean mm-hmm. Space Above and Beyond was kind of like the roadmap of what would happen to Firefly as well. Like one season show created by someone or in the that case was of only Space, one season too. That yeah, that's only awesome. one season. Unlike and Space, did they that make one, like a movie. Then they made a yeah. TV. Movie they made a movie. Yeah. They made a theatrically released movie because Joss Whedon had power. Yes, but yeah, like that's a show where uh, well, unlike Space, that one got aired way out of order order at least space got aired relatively in order of episodes i am i think i don't i haven't heard they anything aired, else. they aired the firefly episodes out of order they uh-huh. aired like the 90 minute pilot like second last yep. <laughs> yeah so and again like fox is known for that and i was just curious of like what was that like for you guys? Like, did it did it intrude upon you? Like, did it weigh on the the show? Like, we felt it, like watching it, like that a sense of impending doom. But like the interference of of it, like we hear tales of like, oh, they had to they would cut this line of the live episode because it had the word testicles in it, and we can't have that because we're Fox. But how was it for you guys working through the show? Like, you're you're young and upcoming. You're 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 finally getting your groove with everything, and then there's like all of this kind of whispers, I would imagine, or more direct stuff happening. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, there was definitely contentious 
interactions with Glenn and Jim in the studios. I remember that. I don't remember them. I think Glenn and Jim had a lot of power, I feel like, over it. I think with their reputation with X-Files. Because um, my understanding, again, just from the POV of all of them, but I think it's true, is like, I think Glenn and Jim really set the tone of X-Files. I think they made that show. And, and Nutter, like Nutter and Glenn and Jim. And I think I think Chris Carter sort of takes a lot of the credit for it, but I think it was really them. That might, maybe I'm wrong, but that's- No, as a, as a fan of X-Files, as a fan of X-Files, we agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like they were the ones every episode where it was a, you know, when you see those two names pop up in the credits like, as writers. like, this is going to be a good one. Yeah. Yeah, and you would get freaky, freaky villains like, you know, um, like Tombs who- Right, those, that really super inbred- that inbred, which they wrote, episode. They, they wrote directly after space. <laughs> yeah, they. Right, right. right. You can tell that they go. We're going to cancel our show. We're going to traumatize your. We're going to push we're, the boundaries of what you're willing to air. We're going to write the highest rated episode of X Files. So, oh, was yeah. it really? Yeah, it's one of the highest. Yeah, yeah. And 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 Tucker's in that episode too. And there's mm. and yeah. there's always this like this story I've heard before of like Tucker read the script and was like, "Are you guys okay?" And the answer is no. <laughs> right. <laughs> they right. Fox just murdered our show. And we're angry, so we're going to write our fucked up script. But yeah, you know, you know, what AMF stands for, of course, right? Yes. And this, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we we talked about that a bit, like adios, motherfuckers. <laughs> Which, yeah, I, I think I, I think Glenn and Jim must have, to a certain extent, had kind of control. Otherwise, how would they have been allowed to do a, an episode with like no dialogue? Like that's just. Well, yeah. Well, from yeah. what I hear, they wanted absolutely no dialogue, and Fox was like, right. no, 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 you have to have some dialogue. Yeah. So it's yeah, compromised. There was a little bit. You but, get compromised where you get to act alongside Coolio, which I don't think <laughs> right. Glenn and Jim wanted, but here you are. You're like at the height of Coolio. Hmm. Yeah. And I have, yeah. R.I.P. And I have another, but I, I don't really, I ran into Coolio later and it was a, at a party and there was like heavy substances involved. That's all I'll, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Wait. Coolio, you say? I'm sure. No, yeah. Morgan. No. no. That can't that cannot be. And you know, you get David Duchovny thrown in near the end of the show to help the show and he was weird. It, yeah, yeah, he refused to help. Yeah. My my girlfriend's uh nieces were were uh were there for that episode. And so I got they were big fans of his, so I got I sheepishly went and asked for his autograph. He was very nice. He was in the makeup trailer and um yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think I think Glenn and Jim, they they kind of. I mean, I don't know. It seemed like they did mostly what they wanted to do, in spite of even toward right towards the end, which I really respect. You know, they were not. They were like, "This is our vision. Uh, it's in our contract." Basically, it seems like they were. I, I don't remember any edits, a specific. I mean, they weren't throwing any kind of gratuitous. You know, they weren't pushing the boundaries with like sex or language no. or anything. But it's, as far as their ability to really uh, do things their own way, I think I was I was playing Cyberpunk twenty seven seven or something, and I, I think there was an ad that had a reference to in vitros or something in it, and I was mm-hmm. wondering if that was. I mean, is is space pretty influential in a kind of stealth way? Do a lot of I think so. Space? I think so. Yeah. I I do. Like as someone who's a fan of it and watched a lot of sci-fi that came after it, there is a lot. Like we there definitely seem to be the war. The war thing bled into those shows afterwards. Yeah. I, started, I started. I noticed that on Babylon Five. Yeah, and mm. yeah, Babylon Five's a bit before, and then during and Tucker Tucker even did Babylon Five right before doing uh, Space. I'm pretty sure, but like the look of the show, like you look at Space, mm-hmm. that desaturated look, that gloomy look, is kind of standard for a lot of shows like Joel did Man in the High Castle and that's one of the most desaturated looking shows of all time and Mm -hmm. you look at your sci-fi contemporaries at that time and they were still a lot of them even B5 was still very colorful still had Mm -hmm. that vibrancy and you guys all in browns and grays and blacks and got mud and dirt all over your faces and it's like what's happening in this show like it's you have to squint and be like what's going on yeah (laughs) <laughs> but now that's kind of more accepted and, and like we're doing The Expanse on our podcast currently and that has some, I feel like has some bleed over, like our main character in that show reminds me of West in a lot of ways mm-hmm. and they have I, the I, concept. I have to watch more. I, I, well, I heard that was good. Occasionally I'll, I like sci-fi, but I'm not like a sci-fi head and I haven't read an incredible amount of sci-fi, but I, I've always loved it and I love the ideas in it. And so The Expanse I heard about 
I watched some of those. Here's here. I, there's an interesting story regarding the war thing. I was I was with a girlfriend at the time in tw- must have been twenty. 2011 and we were in uh, Universal City Walk and uh, that's like near Universal Studios and Glenn had just had us do the the, the uh, audio sort of um, commentary for the the UK DVD set which which we have and yeah. we've listened to those commentary tracks and I've got <laughs> Are, I, is I the miss- commentary good I remember I was being such a wise ass that day I really was just like <laughs> Look, saying whatever came I, into I, my I, head. I love you you did bitch about your hair a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you're the like, helmet, the helmet head, yeah. Yeah, you were like, I hate this long hair. I want, I miss, I, I like when I got to cut my hair. <laughs> so that's the thing, yeah. So, so Cooper did his short hair, and then I was sick of that helmet, corny helmet head they had me in, and I was like, I want my hair short. And Glenn was like, Why do you want to do this? Is it just because Cooper is like, I'm like, No, I just want. I, I think it looks better. I'm more comfortable. And he's like, Okay. Um, but so I'm, I'm in City Walk, and, and I hear this excuse me, mate, excuse me, mate. And I'm like, I turn around and there's this young guy, clearly British, if I'm, as, if I'm right, reading the accent right. He's with a woman and he's like, are, are you, are you Morgan Weiss? Were you, were you in Space Bumpy? I'm like, yeah, yes, I was. Yes, yes. He's like, and so he's, we start talking. He's like, I love that show. He's like, I just got the DVD. And he's like, and I joined the army because I because of that show. And I was like, no, 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 no. don't do that. War's I was bad. Like, I was like, dude, are you okay? Are you all right? He's like, no, no, it went well. It's fine. It's all right. But <laughs> just the British army. Mortified. <laughs> it's good he wasn't in a wheelchair telling me that. <laughs> um, how did you find out the show got canceled? Did they tell you? Did you find out about it through some other means? Like, how did yeah, you find out? I was I was on a trip with my girlfriend and her mother, and we were in Paris, and we were waiting. So the so the show wrapped. <clears throat> the show wrapped, and it was still the the writing was on the wall. Here's I don't know. Joel probably told you this, but so when he, when his little capsule, he's like going, you know, uh, blaze of glory style, as only as only Wang could. Um, the CGI guys were were like, no, we're gonna we're gonna add a little part where it's like he might live. He left in a little compartment, and Glenn was like, dude, it's over. We're getting we're getting canceled. And they were like, no, no, we don't know that for sure. But it was pretty much assumed, you know. Um, yeah, so- Joel to- Joel told us that he didn't know he his character died until he watched the episode. That that they edited it and it's revealed that Wang died. He's like, I I I was supposed to live. <laughs> Oh, so 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 it was just left unknown in the script, and that. So what I've read is there are some like some of the scenes just aren't in that episode, but a lot of like the the idea of if the other members of the fifty eighth are are alive, I just edited it out, out. Like Tucker's scene at the end with McQueen, uh, the Glenn has talked about like it was just take that line out and it just recontextualizes the scene so there's a more of a finality. And with Wang, it's like let's edit in that quick flash of him. Uh, over Cooper when he well, wasn't there in. a piece that broke off because I remember like the CGI. No, I he just were... explodes. He just explodes. He just explodes. Real good okay, in the version, so yeah. maybe that was an argument. I think I think the CGI department they were like, let's add a thing so we you can leave it like a cliffhanger. And Glenn was like, that's so that's what it was. Yeah, Glenn was like, no, there's no point. He the show's over. But but yeah, we didn't know for sure. And I was, it must have been. I mean, we wrapped and then I was off to a European trip. And so it was, uh, I think, a couple a couple weeks after whenever we wrapped in like maybe March or something. Yeah. 1996. Fair enough. Because... But it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't a surprise. It, no. it was just confirmation of what we all knew. No. Um, I guess one of the big things is like, you know, people always wonder, like, if the show continued, like, what would have happened but like i guess for for us is what would you want to have happened like in your in your vision of it like what were you hoping for for west to get up to or for the show to try, kind of play around with um i mean i remember at the time i i i was really into martial arts i was doing jujitsu and i was like so I think I wanted, I remember wanting like a really knockdown, drag out, realistic kind of fight, which again now is more, 
same with weapons handling and everything and with martial arts and because that was the beginning of MMA. I got, I got into jujitsu and I was actually training with Hoist Gracie before the first UFC in 1993 or whatever. Um, so I, so I saw that whole transition and I was into it and, and, and mixed martial arts had not really, it didn't get really big until the late nineties. So I remember talking to, to Glenn about that. Like I want to do a really long, just brutal, uh, realistic fight. Um, but as far as character stuff, yeah, just sort of, it would be interesting to see West become uh, like a grizzled warrior, you know, like a really hardened kind of that whole, yeah, all the opportunity you have in, in war stories to kind of go to those places. I mean, that's what was, that's the thing about acting, to go, to to be able to go to those places. You don't have the, I I would never want to go, go do that. I've had friends that have been to uh, Iraq and stuff, and it's just, uh, it's rough. It's a heavy everything to bear because it is for as someone watching the show and you see west's journey the ending of it is is very downbeat but like your character finds a sense of place where you get your girlfriend back but it's like that's no longer what your character is about and then it would have been like well what is west the, now yeah, the that cause we have, has right. changed yeah now that we've really put Does away really the love kylan yeah <laughs> I mean, we look, we all loved Kylan. <laughs> she was everyone's favorite character. I like the episode where she was a secret chig in disguise and she hated the smell of your stinky bl- blood and that was fun. <laughs> like, she, she's an Australian actress, right? Yes. Like, and she's yeah. one of the ones that they got to, like, bring yeah. over, which is interesting. She came because, over. Yeah. Because it's interesting. To, I, I just always wonder about a little like that because... You don't need her in the show, but she does appear like every now and then. It's like they have to bring this Australian actress over to bring to have this character that doesn't doesn't really need to be in the show, but they did, and I, I kind of like that. It was kind of fun. Like, well, they could recast. Well, they could well, recast to bring, to bring closure to that arc. They had to, yeah. But I guess if it continued, then they, yeah, she probably would have gotten knocked up, right? West and her <laughs> would have settled down, and <laughs> the idea, the idea. Yeah. She would have been. She would have been in Culver City with us filming. Yeah, I, mean, I imagine they. Might have brought her in as a regular. I don't know. Um, Pags was cool. He was a cool guy. They shouldn't have. They shouldn't have killed him off. Was it, does that actor still work? Yes, and uh, right. he's a te- like he's, he does acting mentorship and workshops and teaching and Work, stuff. Teaching, and yeah. We yeah, we've tagged cool him on some of our posts just for a little bit of fun. Of like we, we always have our like oh here's to Pags. We all yeah. miss Pags, yeah. and he seems to have a bit of a humor about it still. And Joel has some pictures of them hanging out during the time that you guys were filming, and everyone c- keeps talking up this guy like hey he was great, and I'm like oh, I would hope so. He's Pags. He, he, was yeah, nice. he was he really was that character. He's just the guy you wanted to hang out and have beers with. He was super cool. Uh, you mentioned this a little bit before we started recording. Uh, you said that you didn't end up taking anything from set. And no. I, I, you've lost things over time. Nothing from so the set. I wonder, like, if you could go back... What are like your top three things that you would want to get? One of the working rifles, the rifles they had rifles that worked. I think they were old M14s or something. That would be cool to have. Um, and that was like a wood shell. Uh, I guess a helmet and then a, a chig suit. Why not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hey, Who look, has it? Have you seen any of that stuff floating around on eBay? It's got yeah, be so some of them have been used in other projects over the years. Heck, I've even seen someone say they were used in some type of advertisement. And I think really? most recently, a bunch of them were purchased for a, a t- like a, um, a project called Space Command, which is like a crowdfunded uh, sci-fi thing with a bunch of different people behind it, like Bruce Boxleitner was in it and Amir Phil and like so a whole bunch of- So the aliens are literally just the stolen ones from our show yep because oh, wow. why you know hey if it's there why not use it it's like a weird sci-fi thing and like with any show you see reused mm-hmm. props and and well i, th- I think all, i think I, I can't remember what i think it was it was a movie all of the saratoga just background set structures and pipes all that stuff that ended up being on some 
was there that Denzel Washington like submarine movie? Or yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah. Like, I think it was a submarine movie. Which makes sense yeah. because it it was basically a, like a big aircraft carrier submarine in space uh, mm-hmm. in Saratoga. And I mean, Futurama, apparently the trivia for Futurama connection is Fox reused all of the sound effects from space above mm-hmm. and beyond for Futurama because, well, he is a library of sci-fi sounds. Why, why, why waste them? Let's use them for Futurama. So I can tell you as a fan of Futurama and having just watched Space Above and Beyond for our podcast, it was such a wild ride hearing some of the sounds <laughs> pop up. Just like, hey, I know that sound from the cards. So, yeah, the, the CGI must look pretty cheesy now of the ships. Some, yeah, most of the time. Uh, yeah. But then it would make up for it with like the really good sets and stuff. Like I love like the hangar bay. I love where, you know, the the, the cockpits for the hammerheads rise out of the yeah. ground. Mm-hmm. That, like that's still very cool. Like you can see, like as said, like the money put into the show. It's just the oh, CGI yeah. is just the times and, you know. We- the times. I bet, yeah, if they ever do, I would imagine at some point they do like a remastered like thing of the, of the show they could pretty cheaply probably even with ai just do a refinement of the cgi stuff just sharpen you know just i bet with even at that point ai tech would be able to do it fairly cheaply cheaply um but we can't trust those they're annoyed they were they were annoyed with something about the uk thing uh that they didn't add a little more money to do some extras some more extras on it because it was just our commentary. Did you guys hear anything about there that? There is some other extras, like little bonus things, like little documentary stuff. And uh, uh, I think in the US, the version of it doesn't have a commentary track and the pilot, you have to buy That's separately. That's what it was. Yeah, it was, the, it was a US version. Yeah, he was like, yeah, why, well, yeah, why are you guys Oh, and the menu apparently has Babylon 5 on it, like the station from Babylon 5, <laughs> not the Saratoga. <laughs> Which... I don't know how that works. Like, yeah. Babylon 5 is not a Fox show. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, who knows? Distribution just didn't give a shit. Like, our copy of it, for whatever I reason. I did that. Well, that happened to me once. I did a I did a TV miniseries with Barbara Hershey and Jane Alexander. It was based on, like, a true story, and I was having an affair with the older woman, Barbara Hershey. And in the big ad, like, they had a whole page ad in the TV guide, and it was me. The, I, I kill her husband and then go to prison, and it was me behind bars. But it wasn't me. It was just some random dude. I don't even know where they got the picture. <laughs> um, so yeah, it happens. I guess as we wrap this out, are there any other interesting behind the scenes things that you want to share? Is there any other little tidbits or memories that come to mind or, or moments of making this series? Mm. Yes. <laughs> I got... <laughs> In Australia, I smoked weed with Arlie Ermey. <gasps> no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm oh, yeah. shocked. Shocked yeah. and appalled. Oh, yeah. He was a tea head. He was a tea head all the way. Yeah. yeah. That was pretty cool. What was he like? I told people that, yeah. and they think that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was he like? Because he, in his movies and shows, he seems both intense and very fun. Like, we all kind of love seeing Arlie Ermey show. He's laid back. I mean, he's, he's still, he's that guy. That's how he talks pretty much, but he's not, no, he's not screaming and, you know, he's not terrifying. Uh, he was super cool. Yeah. Especially on weed. <laughs> yeah. I think they wanted him, they wanted him to come back, but he, he sort of had a renaissance. Well, you know, that was when he was in uh, starting to work in like the Sean Penn uh, capital punishment movie with Susan Sarah. I mean, he, he started being in all these movies. Oh yeah. Again. Like um, it was so a get, it was a get to get him in the pilot. Like if you have someone like him, it adds legitimacy to the project. Like it maybe feels a little bit like oh well, he's just doing his Full Metal Jacket. Well, he's character. doing his, yeah, he's doing that shtick. But I don't think he was not. I think it was really around the same time he sort of had a he he was working, but he wasn't. Then he started being in all these A list movies, and mm-hmm. so by the time they were like, "Would you come back?" He's like, "No, man, I'm a movie I always, star." I would think of him as uh, my favorite performance from him is uh, he plays the televangelist in Fletch Two. Fletch lives. That's one of my favorites. I haven't seen, Fle- I haven't seen Fletch Two. Fletch uh, One is great though. It's so offbeat for him. Like he's 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 just he feels like a real televangelist type, and he's very sleazy and fun in that. But uh, I guess uh, Rachel, do you have any remaining things that you want to ask put forward? 
I don't know. One of the other questions that we had was about fan interactions, but I don't know if you can beat the UK fan who joined the army. That was it. Yeah, that was so that was so random. Yeah. Like I was I would really just get recognized at I guess occasionally I would go with friends to like comic book conventions or whatever. So I'd get recognized there. I'd get recognized at movie theaters occasionally, but, uh, but that was, yeah, that was a wild one. But yeah, when he said I joined the army cause of that show, I was just like, Oh my, I hope we didn't ruin your life, son. But he seemed, he seemed like he was doing fine. With the uh, being in a science fiction show, they, they have a long life. You, 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 this was a one season thing you did a couple of decades ago. And I think it's kind of now a given and maybe even back then that like, once you do some of like a show like this, you will, there will be an audience it sticks. that will last. Like there are Facebook groups and YouTube channels and all this stuff that still talk about space above and beyond. Yeah. And, uh, have you had like other interactions or like, have you had to do like the, like, was there any convention stuff or any kind of things like that for space that they put you guys through? We did a convention. It was a comic convention uh, and it was towards the end. And, and that was, a, I remember getting a question of like, what do you want to do? And I, with the character. And I remember saying that, like, I want Glenn to like write this like fight scene. I want to, you know, I was all into fighting or whatever. I want to do like action <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and besides that, it was, it's all after the show. We did a, we did like a reunion little convention. I really screwed up. I could have gone to the UK. I think, I think James and Joel went out there and they hit me up about it. And I, at the time I was, I was busy and I was, but I should have done it. I could have had a free trip. I'd never been to the UK. I could have gone out there. Um, but we did, we did one a few years after the show was canceled. I forget what years it was like the late nineties. We all met up and then there's been, I think there's been three of, of just kind of fan fan organized little reunion things. Um, and the last one was, was very cool. Uh, We'll say this. The last one, there was everyone was super friendly and cool. There was this couple, there was a couple, and they were selling, I think they were selling merchandise. They had a little table and stuff. And they just were looking at me kind of sideways. Like they were not friendly. It was almost like, oh, they they still don't like West. <laughs> <laughs> Look what you or did, they West. Like, they were like, he got the show canceled or something. <laughs> I don't know. But they were, they were, v, and maybe I misread, misread the looks, but they, they were not like uh, welcoming. I don't know. That was, that was interesting. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a cool, it was, it was small. It was in this uh, little um, convention room at some hotel out in the Valley. Uh, I don't know how many, maybe a couple dozen people, but it was just so great to see everyone. And it was so cool. Yeah. If you haven't seen the videos, of of them all playing guitar. I mean, it was, it was awesome. It must be just really kind of warming in a weird way that this project that got cancelled and it was a one and done thing and it honestly hasn't had a great distribution. Like, it's hard to find. Like, you can watch it on YouTube. Like, that's because of the fans put it, it on YouTube. It doesn't stream. It's not streaming on anything. Not even not even Tubi or anything. No, nope. nope. not that we know. And uh, technically, I guess it's owned by Disney now, right? Because Fox and Disney yeah. and merging. Yeah, I Disney, don't know. The, the Death Star of our <laughs> Disney. It's just Look, sucking, the, sucking the soul out of everything. <laughs> Could you imagine if they put that on Disney Plus, Space Above and Beyond, right there, right there next yeah. to Lilo and Stitch? And I've been watching. You guys, of course, have watched the original, The Prisoner. Have you watched? Oh yes, that? yeah, 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 yeah. That. It's so good. But it just must be just warming in a weird way, or just very sweet that there are still you know these type of reactions. And heck, even now we live in this internet age. And you were talking about at the beginning that the series was you know at the cusp of that, where there was chat rooms, and you weren't really a part of that. But now things have accelerated. Where here we are now talking to you because we wanted to review the show. Like we wanted to go through it episode by episode and talk about it. And we never really thought too strongly if any of the cast or crew would would get involved or hear any of it or any of that. But at the same time, I thought maybe because not it's so small, not enough people do what we did with the show. And I, I just wonder, like, how, what's what's your thoughts on that? Like with how 
the series still has this life and thanks to the internet and, and projects like this where anyone can like write up a review or do a podcast or call yeah. like especially as somebody who isn't as involved in the industry as they used to be yeah yeah i mean it's it's cool there there's a face a few facebook groups i don't go on facebook barely at all anymore but <laughs> they're still i still make comments and like little things they post they're all, they're like they love it. I mean, it's just, it, yeah, it's super, <clears throat> without the internet, I'd have no idea that there was still this life. There was another podcast I came across, I forget how, that they were not quite as kind to the show as you guys sort of, um, I forget what it's called, uh, but the, that those, those are the yours and theirs is the only one I'm aware of. Um, yeah, our friends at Continuum Drag did uh, a coverage of like two episodes a week and they had positive reaction, but a little bit more negative than, than us. Yeah. And they, they were not West heads. Let's just no, say that. No, they were and brutal. I think I had to stop. Li- at a certain point, I'm like, I don't need to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just great to see what, you know, Joel sent me your episodes of your show and I started listening. I was just like, it's just cool to see uh, people appreciating this thing almost 30 years on. And, and yeah, without the internet, I'd have no idea. And Facebook, yeah, there's still a, a tight little hardcore group of fans for it. And to also see that, it, yeah, that it had, it probably has had at least for a while, some influence on, on sci-fi future, you know, later shows and stuff and just ideas. And, and um, it's great. I mean, Glenn and Jim, we all did something definitely, in many ways unique and uh and in some ways it's kind of perfect when it's you know it can't be a cult show unless it dies early and is a little (laughs) wasn't appreciated as much at the time you know yeah that's it um you said that you aren't really acting much nowadays um no it's been not much at all anymore it's probably been uh about 10 years or so i mean my my dad and I had a friend, Albert Pune. I don't know if you're familiar with him. him. Uh, a lot of action movies, sci-fi movies. A lot of yeah, movies, like he a lot of he stuff. did a lot of uh, films. Uh, yeah, he he recently he was the one that recently passed, passed away. away. Right? Yes, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. And there was a like a big Facebook call out from his family, being like, "Hey, everyone who appreciates his movies, come check him out." And so, yeah, I'm aware. I'm aware of his stuff. My a bit. father and I did a few of his last movies, and Albert was just awesome because. He just loved making movies, man. I mean, he was making movies in Hawaii as like a little kid, and he never stopped. Even when he had a he had a degenerative disease, and so. But even all through those years, we were working with him. Even as the as the project became smaller, you know, and smaller, and he was doing a lot of like stuff on you know green screens with actors, and I was able to do. Uh, I told him I wanted to be a villain in one of his things. And he wrote me this great villainous part in this movie. It's called like bullet face or something. And it was just fun. We made it with another actor friend, Scott, Scott Paul, an old friend of my dad's. who was like, he was in the right stuff. He was played uh, Christian Slater's dad in uh, pump up the volume. And, and we all got to work together. Um, uh, so those were the last things that I did. And then, yeah, it's been, it's been years now just kind of drifted off of it or just weren't vibing yeah, with it? I, I just, uh, it, it became, there was, I sort of went through some of my own struggles. I had to get sober at a certain point. And uh, that was a few years after space. And then I started working again and it just, uh, it wasn't the same. Something had changed. It kind of wasn't uh, a good fit, I guess, as much as I, you know, enjoyed elements of it. It just, uh, it was a a bit of me kind of, uh, and a a bit of me not, yeah, not feeling a a certain connection to to doing it anymore. And also just, you know, my career, those early years and leading up to space, I just worked a lot, you know, I was getting a lot of work and and it kind of right out the gate of getting out of school, um, high school and then space and then, you know, working, and life stuff, um, it kind of, uh, 
Yeah, I don't. You you change. I mean, there there was it was not something I I was being around acting as a kid. It wasn't something. It, was like, it wasn't like I I grew up in L.A. So it wasn't something. I didn't come here to be an actor. You know, I grew up around crazy actors and artists, and then I kind of was lucky enough to just have some raw talent and get opportunities. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess in in some sense, I was not uh, a true actor. You know, I mean, I think real actors like they'll be they'll just do theater somewhere. You know, they'll do it. I was never a theater actor so much, even though that was my earliest experiences. I always related more. I, I studied film more. I watched movies. I understood that kind of acting and that kind of craft more than than stage, even though I had some great experiences doing plays. Um, my dad kept trying to <coughs> excuse me, trying to get me to do a play with him for a year, like a while. But I think he's realized He's semi-retired now. Um, I didn't, it just wasn't meant to be. Hmm. Yeah, and with TV and movie making, it's intensive. It, it takes a lot of work to get stuff done. It's not just, oh, they roll the camera and you guys are acting. There's lots of waiting around or in a lot of the projects you've had to do, there's like in this one, at least lots of in like things that you have to go that extra mile with, like you have to wear this and run around over here and, and on and on it goes. And I, I do like how with space... It's a funny job. Yeah, it's a funny it's a job. job. <laughs> uh, I do like with space that there's like this sense of community where you look up anyone on IMDb that's involved and they've most likely worked on other projects by you know, Glenn or Jim or, or mm. with other actors. Like you would go on to be in a very fun episode of, of The X-Files as Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> like, they made a point. Yeah, they made a point of putting taking us all... I don't know exactly... Why? I think it was just sort of nostalgic, a cool little thing to to uh, bring us all on. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it. That was great. That was fun. I mean, it was a small little part, but I, I, uh, Glenn had me read uh, the Don DeLillo book called Libra, which is all about. Uh, it sort of doesn't make a decision on on what exactly Oswald was. You know, it's a little it's a little vague about it, but it was interesting to try and get inside his mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, the more distance I have from acting, I just kind of, it's like, wow, that's a weird job. And also the waiting is just, I think as a kid, as when you're younger, it's sort of your, I guess it drove me crazy sometimes, but I kind of, I was, I, I just tortured myself as an actor too. So much about acting was again, sort of trying to, I had to really believe again, this sort of self-indulgent approach I had for so much of it, which didn't make it as as enjoyable as I could. I and mean, I sort of wasn't able to enjoy a lot of the times to really be present for it. Cause I was so worried about, you know, getting it perfect or whatever, like you could even do that. But now looking back on, on acting, um, how much of part of my life it was and how much time I spent on sets. It's definitely, it's a funny job. It's a weird, it's, it's more of this, it's kind of scientific, you know, because you're just doing all these little pieces over and over again, and they're out of order. It's just a strange, I think theater is more rewarding as far as an actor, because it's just up to you. You're in control for an hour or two. Um, and also Hollywood now is, I mean, my tastes in films are pretty uh, eclectic, but also kind of off off the beat and kind of dark in general and, and, and quirky. And, and I don't like the indie scene we had in the 90s. Why don't we've had nothing like that since? And I'm kind of waiting for a new period like that to happen since, I mean, I'm blown away by the, how amazing kids can make things look that they shot on an iPhone with some editing skills. So all the, all the tools are there for people, but um, I, th I think there's so much of, 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 of culture is about just content as opposed to like understanding the basics of laws of filmmaking and just kind of uh uh it's disposable now you know it's like yeah, a yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of conversation about that especially with like television shows and even ones that are good and how the streaming services very much treat them like content it's like okay well we did two seasons cancel it move on to the next project uplift yeah. it and when we were doing the podcast, when we were releasing episodes, we wanted to talk to some cast members, but the strikes were on because of everything mm. happening in the industry. Mm -hmm. So we have to wait a while to do it. And it's just like... Well, they couldn't talk to you? No, not really. Uh, not not particularly. Like, it's part of, like, the strikes. And because technically oh. this is... Yeah, and emotional emotional right, sort of right, right. This is work that, you know, is blah. And also 
some of them, like, you know, Joel have things in the works that they mm. would probably like to talk about. Like, he's in The Walking Dead uh, Paris show, like with uh, Daryl Dixon, Paris uh, Walking Dead show. Has, as, in what? Paris, France? Yeah, yeah. And he was shooting, like, when he was, when he was uh, talking to us about the podcast, he was coming to and from France all the time filming stuff. And so, what is it called? Oh, it's like The Walking Dead. I can't remember, like. The Walking uh, Dead, may we? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And Joel, it seems he was being coy, but it seems like he's playing a villain. And oh, yeah. It seems like that, he does I that a lot. A tight, I bet there's a tight confidentiality clause on that show, probably. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, I, it's just a weird. It's a weird time for Hollywood. I, I just, think, I mean, the joke I made about Disney. It's just, it, it's, it's real though. It's sort of like mm. I remember read, hearing that like when they bought it, they they dismissed all of the the fan fiction and the mythology that had been built up by all the novelizations and all that stuff. They're like, yeah, we don't care. You, mm-hmm. So you throw all that away and then you see what they're making. And it's just, again, like I, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm not trying to shit on anything people like or whatever, but just like I've watched some of uh, some of like the, the, the TV series of the spinoff things of the star Wars stuff. And I, I just, I don't, it's all it all looks great but there's something i don't know there's something generally missing same thing with the marvel movies not all of them there's some of like mm. a few of them like avengers things like there's interesting ideas the writers are doing interesting things but in general um well it's very yeah it's a very different age where oh, nowadays yeah. you get actors they don't even know what they're filming for like what, oh, what yeah, the scene that, or movies or any of it that is causes that's, problems but for me yeah a lot of it's of... just a lot of it is your film again we were able to be on in the environment like they spent all this money mm-hmm. to just turn this whole sound stage into this thing as an actor that's so great it's so easy it makes it so much easier and so much more fun and i think that really comes through so there's an element of just like having to be the guy who plays Loki or who's such a great actor, like all these, but you're, you spend the entire time on green screen and that's just gotta be boring after a while. Yeah, and, and or it takes and, me out of it. And or like, imagine if you did space nowadays and they're like, oh, well, we couldn't get Morgan in to do the, the looping. Let's just use some AI to mm-hmm. do the voice right. and try and get away with it. Or, or, oh, that actor wasn't there. Let's just CGI their face in the background. No one will notice. It's like, no, we all right. notice. We all yeah, notice. All that, all that stuff's getting very, I wasn't, Paying cl- like a uh, sound a lot of the strike was about the the background actors signing their likeness off for the future, but I don't even understand that. Why not just make a fake person? I, I, why not just have the AI make someone? Why would you reference why would you have to pay reference, reference models? I guess yeah. for the programs yeah. these these AIs as as seen in space have to learn. I mean, it's like we're, we're it's, it like the real life is turning into a Philip K. Dick movie. It's really getting like cyberpunk. It's wild. Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But uh that's all. That's all we have for you. And I'm so Thank happy you. and and this is such a thrill to be able to to sit down and and chat with you and I know Rachel was uh we were talking about before it's like you know, I hope he's a good sport because Rachel was very <laughs> vocal about her her journey. No, no, West. I mean I I listened to a bunch of them and I like I I agree with you. Like I was going through the same process when you were making it. Like I understood that uh you know, I think some of it was uh, like the pilot was like Nutter didn't know how to how to navigate. He, he his choices weren't great. My choices weren't great. The writing was difficult. It's like what was the lines like? We're gonna be on a planet with three waterfalls. You know, like all this like flowery poetic writing. So we all didn't know. We should have just played against that stuff because it's already sentimental. Um, so yeah, we. No, nothing, nothing you said I didn't disagree with. Um, it was, uh, they threw us a curveball and we were able to finally turn it around in the end. But no, I appreciate it. You guys were really fair and cool and you seemed to enjoy it and see and appreciate where we we improved the show and it's just awesome. Yeah, it was great to talk to you guys. Yeah, neither of us are going to join the army. Not, you're Thank not you. inspiring Please. me to join the army. Okay, Good. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry no, to tell you. I don't think West. It. I don't think West should inspire. <laughs> that shouldn't have inspired anyone. To go Especially like shoes. when you see what happens to his kid brother. But no, no when, when, especially when they- after that. So, so tell me that. I, I feel like I saw. Uh, was there some talk of the of like Fox maybe or you know doing a reboot of the show? 
Was I that think, just yes? I think people just want that. Yeah. I think it's okay. just at the end yeah. of the day, people just a want second chance. a second chance or to play around with what the show was doing because uh, even though they you know, they wanted to write the war show, the sci-fi ideas were so so particular mm. that they still scratch that itch. Like the the silicates, I still think are, are a marvelous Amazing. like yeah. android idea that you don't get in a lot of other sci fi shows. Like they're fun and the chigs are fun and people just kind of want and the more. tanks, of course, and the tanks and everything that you play with there. And 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 also the show just ends in a way where it's like, no, that can't be it. <laughs> Please, no, we can't. Yeah, I mean, the ch- if it had just been a few years later with some more CGI, the chigs, because sometimes they, they do the shots of the chigs and they're fully standing there and they look, I mean, on the one hand, they look kind of iconic and badass, but it also looks kind of, if they had been able to make it much more murky and elusive and maybe kind of morph that the beings could sort of do more things physically that were kind of mercurial or whatever. Blending some of those seam lines. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But... uh well, thank you so much for talking with us. And everyone, thank you so much for tuning in and listening and or watching this. Uh, we are hoping to have more conversations with people involved in space. Uh, Tucker Smallwood is up next. He's someone oh, that uh, we're really hoping yeah. to chat to. He's Fingers crossed. I mean, talk about a guy that does not stop working. He's in every show, every movie, oh, literally. Yeah. When we were on holiday break, went up to Rachel's family's place. They had the TV on in the background and... Uh, just a random episode of Jake and the Fat Man, and there was Tucker being a lawyer. I'm like, hey, look, it's Tuck. <laughs> so he's uh, hopefully up next, and um, really do want to uh, thank uh, all of the people that uh, you know have supported our Patreon, where we upload these things first, and then eventually onto the main feed. It means so much, and everyone's just been so positive. And yes, all of the the Facebook groups and 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 all of the online circles for the Space Above and Beyond fandom have just been so so just with us for this journey and it's just been really great to have the honor of being able to get these behind the scenes things because we are very much people when we watch a show like we we engage with the show and then we look up the trivia and then we're like wondering what's this thing and what's this thing and like you were talking about like the the dvds and doing the commentaries and i miss that era where we could have commentary tracks on dvds or blu-rays and not only that but the, the most open and frank ones you'll ever have like i love the space ones because <laughs> the commentary track names names yeah there's like, no reason <laughs> <laughs> like there's nothing to be lost there yeah. so um we can be found everywhere yum yum podcast or yum yum pod follow us support us do whatever you need to do but uh morgan thank you for being here thank you guys it was great and uh everyone yeah can we give it up to pags r.i.p pags here's to pags we all miss you pags <laughs> r.i.p brother